There we go. The slides are not so performant, but they are safe. <laughs> so I wanted to give an overview of Ethereum 2 for information security professionals. Um, so what I want to do uh, is sort of show you where we're looking in the protocol and the implementations. And I'm hoping that people will be inspired to come along uh, and perhaps fill in the gaps if you can see we're missing something or assist with the, the things that we're working on now and, and work with the other teams too. So I'm going to be talking about validator safety. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the phase zero uh, software components, how, how we're viewing it uh, as a set of, set of software bits. Um, so I'm going to be talking, so phase zero means um, Casper uh, proof of stake without shards or execution. Uh, and Adrian's going to be talking about validator privacy on the network uh, and the differential uh, fuzzing work that's been going on in F2. So I want to talk about validators. Uh, as you know, uh, they are replacing the miners as the block producers. So uh, taking them offline will affect the liveness of the network and stop new blocks, which is very bad. So I want to talk about the two failure modes of validators. So we have these two different modes. This is offline validators and equivocating validators. So an offline validator is a validator uh, that's either just simply not connected to the internet or the network, uh, or they're on a, on a different minority chain. So from the view of the, the majority canonical chain, uh, whether or not they're just completely offline or whether they're on a different chain, it's basically the same to us. So these validators, they stand to lose in rewards what they would have, what they, they stand to lose in penalties what they would have gained in rewards. So they're going to start sort of leaking out at 5 to 10, uh, 5 to 10 percent per year. Um, this is in the case where there's only just a handful of validators. If there's enough validators to prevent finality, the system swaps into this mode where it starts to quickly eject validators. Um, but this is just sort of like general individual case uh, losses. Uh, so then on the other hand, we have equivocating validators. So these are validators that have uh, produced conflicting messages. So the easiest one is, you know, two blocks at the same height that are different. It's a double vote. They violated the protocol. They're going to lose a lot of state quickly. They're going to get slashed, and they're going to get ejected from the validator set. So these two modes have two interesting properties. The first is that taking a validator offline is generally an unprivileged attack. So if you know a bug that causes a node to expend its resources and do a denial of service or... Uh, or perhaps crash, then you can generally do this by just connecting to it on the, on the internet and then sending in a package and watching, packet and watching it go down. Whilst on the other hand, um, making a validator equivocate should, if the, if the software stack is good, uh, require elevated privileges on the host machine. So it requires someone to have access to the machine which is running the software of the validator. The reasoning being is that if a validator can keep a history of its previously signed messages, uh, it can check these messages and detect if there's equi uh, an equivocation before it signs a new one. So if you imagine the equivocation detection and the signing is just like one black box, there should be no message that you do or don't send to it that can cause it to equivocate without it being aware of it uh, beforehand. So now I want to move on to the software components. This is how uh, the researchers and implementers have been thinking about this system uh, in two, two distinct components. One is the beacon node, the other is the validator client. So the validator client, oh sorry, the, the beacon node uh, is what we know as Geth. This is the big piece of software. It connects to the peer-to-peer -peer network. It gets peers, imports blocks, does state transitions, verifies signatures. Uh, but importantly, it doesn't sign messages. That is the job of the validator client. So the validator client, uh, it connects to the beacon node and uses it as a source of truth. So it doesn't need to connect to the internet directly, it connects via the beacon node. Uh, and then it requests blocks, its duties from the, from the beacon node, uh, signs them and then returns them. So this is where we have this relationship where a bad beacon node can cause a validator client to be offline uh, by either sending it nothing or sending it garbage. Um, but it shouldn't be able to, if it's like a sovereign, well-maintained validator client, the beacon node should not be able to make it be slashed. So moving on, uh, this is a bit of a networking overview of the two components here. Here I have these two binaries here um, that are perhaps in the wrong Linux folders, but we'll ignore that. Um, they don't necessarily have to be uh, two distinct binaries. They could be the same thing. But this pattern is what we're seeing from the majority of clients and, and ours included. I'll, I'll sort of show you why on the next slide. Um, but in the terms of networks, we have the internet over here, which is the untrusted zone. Uh, so this is where. We have uh, anybody on the internet, we're, we're connecting to peers via Discovery v5 using UDP, uh, and then we're talking to those nodes using a libp2p, generally over TCP. Um, so this is where people can start to you know, do denial of service attacks, and this is where we need to be cautious of this. But on the other hand, we have a private network over here, so this is a LAN or a VPN, something we trust, uh, and this is where the validator client connects to the beacon node um, via an API. I've said TCP here, but it could be anything. 
Um, so the reason that we have this private network over here is to isolate the validator client from the internet to reduce its attack service and the people that can get at it. Uh, and I just been mentioned here, so the, the two databases here, there's the Beacon node has, this is like the big, like kind of get style level DB or rocks DB database full of the chain. And the validator client will keep its own database uh, where it maintains its history of messages enough so it can't get slashed. Uh, and perhaps some private keys either on disk or, or on a Trezor. So this is what I was mentioning before about the reason that we've separated the validator client out. It's because it can talk to multiple Beacon nodes. So uh, we may have the case, typical pattern would be, validator client connects to one of them, uses it as the source of truth of the chain, and perhaps it'll, uh, when it produces a block or an attestation, it may send it to a few of them just to ensure that the, that the block gets propagated out to the network. And the validator client can also maintain a sense of quality of service of its beacon node. So if the beacon node is uh, not responding or, or it's not, it's perhaps referencing some other node to see whether its blocks are appearing in the chain, if it decides the quality of service is not good, it can just hop over to another beacon node. Uh, and because it's maintained a database of signed messages, um, it may be offline during that hop if they're on different chains, but it shouldn't be able to be slashed. So now, uh, as my last slide, I just want to go through, uh, this is the inside of a beacon node. Um, so the big binary, um, this is kind of like a very simple overview from a security only perspective uh, of what's going on. So this is um, where messages may come in here on the left uh, from the internet and end up in our database, or perhaps uh, we're doing a response, pulling something from the database and sending it back to the internet. Uh, so the first thing that we see from the internet is a networking stack, that's libp2p. Um, so we're being cautious here of Eclipse attacks where we you know, surround the validator and give it a minority view of the network. Uh, alternatively, um, we have to be careful here with, uh, not alternatively, but we have to be careful here of uh, validator privacy. Adrian will talk about this. Uh, and we're also wary of resource exhaustion here if we can make libp2p do uh, too much work and slow us down. We have marshalling where we're encoding and decoding bytes from the network. So we have a new uh, encoding and decoding scheme that's simple serialized, as I said. Uh, it is quite simple and straightforward, but it is new. Uh, and it uses pointers, they're called offsets. So here we need to be quite careful of uh, seg faults and all the interesting things that come with um, encoding formats. And perhaps uh, on the higher level here, we have a consensus message that we may intend to import to our database, or on the, the lower level here, we're, we're validating requests that we may give back to a response to someone. So the consensus message validation is, uh, is a very complex uh, piece of software. So this is um, the, the implementation of the F2.0 specs repository. So this, um, the F2.0 specs is written, uh, optimized for readability, but not for speed of execution. So one of the really important things that client developers must do is produce optimized versions of this specification. So uh, we need to be careful that these optimizations don't cause consensus forks. You know, given the same block and state, we produce the same post state. So we're paying particular attention here through fuzzing, which Adrian will talk about. Um, we're also very cautious of resource exhaustion here. Uh, perhaps someone sends a block uh, that's valid but takes a long time to, pro to, to process. Um, we want to we wanna really avoid this. Um, something else we want to be particularly careful of uh, is blocks where it takes us a long time to determine whether or not it came from a valid producer. So sometimes we have to do work to figure out who should have produced the block. Um, so we need to be particularly careful here because if people can make us do work to figure out who should have sent it, that means anyone can send it to us. Um, so these are attacks that are open to anyone, not just people that are inside the validator set. So this is something we've been actively working on lately. Uh, there's a lot of arithmetic in here, addition, subtraction, um, division that can you know divide by zero or we can have uh, underflows, overflows. Um, we're also doing a lot of access to arrays in here where we're rewarding people. Um, so this is where we need to be very careful of seg faults too. Uh, and then finally here we have the request validation. So this is where we've, uh, Ethereum 2 has a new uh, networking protocol. So during the design we're being quite cautious to make sure that we don't uh, allow for requests that may take an unreasonable amount of time uh, in order to respond to them or process them. So this is the end of my slides uh, and we're going to be hearing from Adrian about validator privacy and differential fuzzing. Uh, yeah, so for the rest of this talk, I just wanted to give uh, a very brief overview of two specific examples of uh, some Ethereum, uh, some security considerations in Ethereum 2. So specifically validator privacy and differential fuzzing. So for validator privacy, what are validators? We need to know what these guys are first, uh, which I'm sure you all know. But 
Anyway, validators are uh, Ethereum 2 entities that drive consensus via staking on Ethereum and performing specific tasks. In particular, they need to vote on shards and beacon blocks. Um, and at the network layer, they need to produce blocks and they need to produce attestations. So that means if you want to be a validator, you need to have a beacon node that's connected to the network that actively produces blocks, produces attestations. So I want to try and kind of give you a, a high level overview of what the actual issue we have with validator privacy. Uh, in Ethereum 2, we're using a protocol to publish and um, propagate blocks and attestations on the network called Gossip Sub. There's Protocol Labs, I think, in about an hour, are giving a deep dive into this particular protocol. But right now, I just want to give a, like a very high level overview of roughly how it works and, and why there's an issue or, or a potential issue or security consideration inside of that. So this is a simple peer-to-peer -peer network. It's what I'm trying to uh, what I'm trying to show here in this diagram. Uh, each of the circles are beacon nodes. Uh, the direct lines or the the solid lines between those are direct connections, physical connections, IP, IP. TCP connections, if you want, uh, between the nodes. And you can consider this as a very rough uh, Ethereum to peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, so of all the nodes in the network, there's a subset of nodes, which are validator nodes. Uh, what I mean by a validator node is a beacon node that has a validator client attached to it, and they're the ones that are producing blocks or attestations. When we publish a block or an attestation um, on the network, let's consider this uh, validator node in the middle when we want, when he wants to, he or she wants to produce a block on the network. Uh, it uses Gossip Sub. The way that this works to publish a block is you select a subset of your connected peers and you send them the block. Uh, in turn, they do the same thing. In turn, they do the same thing and the block uh, or attestation gets propagated across the network such that the entire network receives the block. Okay, so what's the issue with this? The issue is that the first people you initially connect to, what happens if one of them is malicious? They have a direct connection to you, so they know what your IP address is if you're a validated client on the network. Uh, in practice, a malicious actor was actually going to release or, or deploy a whole range of these nodes, and through timing analysis, they can actually work out who are the validators, specifically their IP addresses on the network. So assuming that you can perform this attack, you can essentially collect the IP addresses or the physical addresses of all the validators on the network. So why is this an issue? So it's an issue uh, for a number of reasons. The first one is that you, if you know a specific validator's IP address, you can target that computer and you can DOS it. You can perform an Eclipse attack, for example, which segregates it from the network. A validator that's segregated from the network can't perform its task that's required to do, and therefore it's, uh, valid, it, it, they, they will lose their stake. So what that means in practice, if someone comes along and says that you look fat in a pair of jeans, you go, righto, I'm going to find your IP address. You segregate them from the network, and they lose their stake as, as punishment. Uh, a more... Uh, a more severe attack and, and sophisticated attack is if you if you know all the validators' IP addresses on the network, you perform a large-scale attack on a majority of those validators, and you kick a majority of validators off the network so that they cannot perform their, their tasks. Uh, if you do that, you can prevent or delay chain finalization because the a majority of validators aren't finalizing or, or agreeing on blocks. You can amplify validator loss because if a large number of validators are disconnected from the network at the same time, it, it amplifies the amount of stake that they lose. Um, and you can increase your own rewards by uh, removing competing validators. So it gives you some incentive to perform these attacks. Uh, so this is an active research topic in Ethereum 2 at the moment. So we don't have a specific solution as what we're actually going to use. But there have been some proposed solutions. So some ideas are that we can run uh, a set of backup DOS hardened nodes. So what that means is that if you are running uh, a validator client with a beacon node and you are publishing blocks and attestations and you find that they're not being received on the network, you can point your validator client to one of these hardened backup DOS, uh, uh, hardened beacon nodes or beacon, uh, yeah, beacon nodes, which will then propagate it for you. Uh, another solution is that for all validator nodes, you could probably put them behind uh, Tor, I2P, or, or Mixnets, which are network layer kind of infrastructures which, which mask your IP address, but there's, there's some latency issues with this. There has been some analysis about how bad this is. Um, Handle is an attestation aggregation strategy which has been proposed by Pegasus from Consensus. Uh, they're also dealing with this problem, so if you're interested in this kind of thing, I suggest having a look through uh, some of their research papers. Um, I'll have some references afterwards. Uh, another interesting idea is adding Dandelion inside Gossip Sub. So again, Gossip Sub is our message propagation system. Uh, Dandelion is a, an anonymization framework for uh, anonymizing Bitcoin transactions on the Bitcoin network. Um, and I just want to give a rough 
overview of how that might work in our, in our gossip subnetwork uh, or what is currently being suggested. So with Dandelion, there's uh, an initial phase. So instead of us, when we want to produce a block or publish a block across the network, we don't use gossip sub immediately. We route it through a few peers first, and then those peers on our behalf will propagate it via gossip sub. Uh, and this is a stochastic process, so there's a random number of nodes that it gets routed through. So as a very rough overview of how this works, uh, let's consider the same validator node that wants to produce this, that publish the same block. If we have dandelion in it, the first an anonymizing phase is we route it through two adjacent peers, we choose them. Each of those peers then, for example, flip a coin. And they flip a coin as to whether they are going to propagate it via gossip sub on our behalf on, or forward it onto another block. So the first peer, let's say the one at the bottom, he's flipped a coin and he is going to propagate it across the network. The top one flips the coin and, and finds out, oh, I'm not actually going to propagate it, I'm going to um, pass the block onto somebody else to then propagate it via gossip sub. So those two peers then do the same coin flip and they find out that they're also going to propagate via gossip sub. So we now have three nodes that are going to propagate via gossip sub, which just does the exact same uh, process as what we did earlier. It propagates across the network. So in this example or in this scenario, we find that the blue peers are the ones that are the first ones that have received it via the gossip sub messages. And to, from their perspective, it looks like the, these three nodes that have started it are the source nodes. For each of the gray nodes that received the message, they're unsure about which the source was because the packet that they received could have either been the source or just another peer that has just flipped the coin and is propagated on behalf of somebody else. So this is the rough idea of anonymizing the validator client source inside of Gossip Sub. Um, again, this is a, an active research topic that we haven't decided on what we're doing. There's, I, I encourage anybody that's interested in, in this kind of a problem to look at the online discussions that we're having at the moment, uh, or to contact us afterwards, or just have a chat, because uh, there's some interesting problems that we should, we should address here. Um, so here are some references to have a look at further details, as I only have time to just very hand wavy kind of go over this. Um, so secondly, I want to talk about differential fuzzing. Uh, differential fuzzing is a project that Sigma Prime has recently adopted in an attempt to security harden all Ethereum clients before mainnet. Um, so let me explain what differential fuzzing is by firstly explaining what fuzzing is. Uh, fuzzing is a security analysis tool uh, used to find abnormal behavior in software. So if we consider an arbitrary program, for example, uh, a Rust SSZ crate, uh, you can think of this as just an arbitrary function that has a set of inputs and a set of outputs. A fuzzer generates arbitrary data, puts it in as inputs, and, and verifies that the outputs are what you expect, or if you have something explode, then you know something's wrong with your code. If you actually have the source code, uh, you can do something called guided fuzzing, which allows the fuzzer to instrument the source code uh, and mutate the input function such that it maximizes the code execution paths of your function. So you can maximally check that your uh, code does what it expects, and you try and find these bugs. So how does this relate to Ethereum 2? In Ethereum 2, there's a whole range of clients over a variety of different programming languages. Uh, each of the clients have implemented the consensus logic their own way. Uh, and if there, so there is a chance that any of these clients, uh, given a set of inputs, could produce an output that is different to another client. Uh, and this is bad because if we run this on a network, uh, and a malicious actor knew what that input was and it could segregate one of the clients from the rest, uh, all users that are using that client on the network could in principle have a consensus fork across the network, which is something we really, really do not want. So the idea is we want to, before we hit mainnet, is to ensure that uh, all of these clients that, are, that have implemented the Ethereum 2 consensus logic implement it in such a way that all of the inputs are uh, pretty much every input we can possibly give it produce the same output amongst all the clients so we don't get these forking amongst the clients. So th specifically, the, each of the clients implement uh, a whole range of functions on the network level and the consensus level and everywhere. But there's uh, the main core consensus things we really want to test are the state transition functions. Um, there's a whole heap of functions involved in this, but you can kind of summarize these into three main functions the state processing, block processing, and epoch processing. So these are the main ones we want to target to ensure that all the clients conform to. Uh, so the way that this is done uh, in a single slide, very high level overview, is we have a piece of software, which we call a differential fuzzer. Uh, it has plugins that essentially we al allows us to plug in each of the clients, more specifically their state transition functions. Uh, and the fuzzer itself will 
uh, similar to uh, an ordinary FASA, generate a, a whole heap of random inputs designed for these state transition functions, send them individually to each of the clients, get a response, and make sure all the clients uh, agree on the response. If there's a difference, then we know that there's a difference between the implementations and the clients, and we, we're going to check this. This is something that uh, we are currently actively developing. We still need to onboard a number of clients. Uh, and again, anyone that's interested, I, uh, I encourage you to come and have a chat with us after it. Um, so I only had enough time to really just very highly go over some security considerations that we have to give you a rough idea of some of the things that are going on. Uh, but this is the end of our talk. So if, if you're interested in any of these topics, I encourage you to come and contact uh, Paul or I or anyone else around. Thank you. Thank you.